Good afternoon. I'm David Luberoff, the center's deputy director, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's talk by Tommy Hill, who was a joint center Meyer doctoral fellow. Before I introduce Tommy, I want to let you know about a couple of upcoming events. Two weeks from today at 12.15 p.m., Jennifer Malinsky, who directs our Housing and Aging Society program, will discuss insights that emerged from a forthcoming report on multi-generational housing, specifically what we in the U.S. might learn from a very interesting pilot program in Germany. Jan will be a co-author of that report, along with Anne-Marie Brady and our colleague Bailey Hugh. A week after that, on April 21st, Lauren Russell, who, like Tommy, received a Meyer Doctoral Fellowship from the Center, will discuss her forthcoming working paper on changes in state laws that, starting in the 1970s, made it much easier for landlords to get information about prospective tenants' criminal records. Lauren is introducing a new data set and presenting some preliminary results of how that access affected individuals' access to housing. More information about both talks is available on our website. Lauren's talk will be the last public event of the spring semester, but I do want to note that in mid to late June, the Joint Center will release its annual State of the Nation's Housing Report. Watch for emails about that release, which has not yet been scheduled. And now on to today's presentation. Our speaker, Tommy Hill, is an economist at Fannie Mae who received a doctorate in urban planning from Harvard last spring. His fascinating dissertation, which was supported in part by his Meyer Doctoral Fellowship, focuses on the relationship between quantitative data, economic models, and the urban development process in the United States from the late 1800s to the present day. In this talk, he'll focus on the 1920s when many key elements of our current data infrastructure system were created. While that might not seem relevant today, as you'll hear, the issues that led to the creation of that system and the ways that it was and has been used are surprisingly timely and relevant today. Tommy will talk for about 35 to 40 minutes and then answer your questions for about 15 to 20 minutes. You can submit those questions via Zoom's Q&A feature where you, where you can also indicate your interest in questions posed by others. We'll be monitoring those questions and we'll try to ask as many of them as possible. My apologies in advance if, as seems quite likely, we don't get to all of your questions before we wrap things up at 2.15. Sami, it's all yours. Thanks so much, Dave, for that introduction. And it's a pleasure to present my research here today. Uh, I'm really grateful for the support that the Joint Center has given me over the course of this research project. Um, so to echo Dave, welcome everyone. I am Tommy Hill. I was a Meyer Fellow at the Joint Center for Housing Studies in the previous academic year. And today I'll be presenting research drawn from my doctoral dissertation and now book project on the history and impact of data collection about property markets in the United States. The research I'll be presenting today focuses on the origins of federal data collection about housing and construction, which began in a serious way in the 1920s. As I'll explore in this talk, the major indexes and monthly statistical series of housing and construction widely used today by economists, housing scholars, investors, and others in the building industry were put into place at the national level over a remarkably short period of time in the early 1920s. As I'll argue, these statistics were assembled for specific political purposes, which have been largely forgotten by contemporary users of these statistics. These forgotten political purposes give context to sources of statistical information now widely taken for granted by housing scholars specifically and also by the larger pool of economists who use data about housing supply as an index of economic health. As I'll show, data itself, data itself was expected to play a role both in alleviating one of the most severe nationwide housing shortages in the history of the United States and in stabilizing the cyclical fluctuations of the American economy at large. The research I'll be presenting in my talk today is drawn from the second chapter of my dissertation titled Construction, the Balance Wheel of Business, 
This expression was often directed specifically at housing production. And this conception of housing as a balance wheel is really an amazing metaphor for the role that housing production was expected to play in the new economic order that took shape after the First World War. This expression was coined by one of the pioneers of construction statistics in the 1920s, the economist Thomas Steele Holden of the FW Dodge Corporation, which to this day is the major supplier of construction statistics in the US, and thus is a firm I'll be discussing at some length in my talk. The perspective this metaphor embodied became commonplace in the first half of the 1920s. As we will see, this was a period in which the notion of economic cycles in general became an obsession for both economists and for policymakers at the federal level. Construction, and in particular the construction of housing, was correctly perceived as a massive component of these cyclical fluctuations, one which, if properly understood, could serve as a counter-cyclical balance for the economy as a whole. Reliable, comprehensive statistics were integral in the effort to make housing serve this role. With adequate information, developers and financiers would know would be able to take advantage of low costs of materials and labor during recessions and thus provide for the nation's housing needs while also fueling a return to growth. But before I dive into the origins of these statistics, I'd like to give some context about the larger research project and how this chapter fits into it. The title of my dissertation is Land Capital Information, Statistics and Economic Models in the American Built Environment. In each chapter, I explore a distinct wave of data collection about housing, construction, and the built environment, beginning with the first economic studies of property markets at the turn of the 20th century, and concluding with the digital revolution of the 80s and 90s. In each instance, more comprehensive data allowed for the emergence of larger, more sophisticated firms in the fields of construction and property finance, capable of scaling their operations over larger geographic areas and accessing a larger pool of capital. Data collection about construction and real estate has always gone hand in hand with the growth of economic ideas about cities and property markets. These successive waves of data collection have made it possible for housing scholars today to measure, for instance, the gap between housing supply and housing demand at the national and local levels, to forecast the future volume of housing construction, and to measure the effects of monetary policy on the macroeconomy. In every historical episode I examine, there's an evident faith that better quality information and more sophisticated analysis of that information by economists and statisticians would serve to stabilize the real estate development field, to tame the fluctuations of an industry infamous for booms and busts. This faith often cuts across the worlds of business, government, and academia, giving rise to an often universal mindset that this time is different. We simply have a better understanding of the property market than in previous periods. That is, of course, never the case. One perhaps facile argument of mine in this book is that, if anything, new waves of data collection about real estate and housing production have had a tendency to inflate the, prop the bubble dynamics of the real estate market, precisely by making it easier to commoditize property, to buy and sell real estate debt and equity like any other asset. I should state at the outset, and for context, that I first encountered the statistical series I'll be discussing today as a statistician as a PhD student focused on housing in my dissertation research, and also as a research assistant here at the Joint Center for Housing Studies. The graph here on monthly construction activity in the United States over the past century is something I put together in the early stages of my dissertation research and is stitched together from a handful of different data sources, the most important of which is the US Census's Construction Put in Place series, which compiles the dollar value of new construction at the national level and for individual states on a month-by-month -month basis, a series which the US Census has been compiling since the 1960s. In order to produce this graph, I synthesized this series with older data from the US Department of Commerce and from the FW Dodge Corporation, which I've already mentioned, and which since the 1920s has been the census's primary source for monthly data on most property types. When I began my dissertation research almost five years ago, what I was really after was an explanation, whether economic or psychological, for the evident cyclical pattern of urban development in the United States. The periodic booms and busts of construction are unmistakable even at first glance of this chart. We can see the flurry of construction in the so-called Roaring Twenties, followed by the long and deep hiatus of the Depression years. The long boom of the post-war decades capped by the go-go years of the 1960s and followed by the doldrums of the 1970s. The extreme spasm of development that defined the 1980s, the highest spike on this graph, 
which filled American downtowns with postmodern monuments and their cheaper knockoffs, and which dotted American suburbia with immense megamalls. The sequence of booms in the 90s and 2000s, which culminated, as we all know, in the great financial crisis. And finally, the gradual return to growth in the years since. Why the urban development cycle recurs seemed to me a profound societal mystery in need of an explanation. As I continued to conduct preliminary research, I found that I was far from the first person to ask this question. But while I was laying the groundwork for this project, assembling data sets from trade publications, municipal deeds registries, and the US Census Bureau, I found myself relying on the same small set of sources in every era, specifically the ones listed at the foot of this chart. Invariably, as I tried to trace each of these series back to their starting point, I found myself consulting material from the 1920s. As I'll discuss in this talk today, by the mid-1920s, the national statistical apparatus for monitoring the American construction sector had emerged in essentially its contemporary form, with a set of private nationwide data collectors supplying federal agencies with monthly statistics on housing construction and the construction of other property types, and a set of statisticians across government and academia analyzing those statistics to gain insights about the nation's economic health. Our ability to pose questions about the national housing market and to interrogate them quantitatively, not to mention the very idea that housing production and construction at large are cyclical, is unthinkable without the quantitative revolution in housing scholarship of the 1920s. Of the periods I study in my dissertation, the 20s was probably the most momentous explosion of data collection and quantitative techniques in the long history of American urban development, greater even than the digital revolution of the 1980s. The nation's private and public bodies for monitoring the property market and its largest component, housing supply, took shape over a short number of years in the early and mid 1920s. At the beginning of the decade, the construction sector, and in particular housing supply, was an opaque and mysterious field, essentially void of serious economic research or statistical analysis. This vast marketplace had up to that point been rife with inefficiencies prone to episodes of collective mania, which left a glut of built space at certain times and places, and a dearth of quality housing at others. In the eyes of the era's leading economists and statisticians, better quality information held the key to taming this vast industry. Reliable, comprehensive statistics would allow industry practitioners themselves to temper their more chaotic impulses and to subject their production to the careful analysis of trained economic experts. Such analysis offered the promise of a stabilized and continuous supply of high quality built space without the need for more heavy handed government intervention. The image on this slide, which I'll return to in a minute, is representative of this new perspective. This was a graph printed in an industry publication, the Architectural Forum, whose readers extended far beyond architects to include the era's major developers, financiers, and builders. This graph and variants of it appeared in each month's issue of the forum from early 1922 onwards, constructed using a range of publicly available series compiled by the Department of Commerce on factors such as the cost of building materials and the volume of new construction planned and completed month by month. This graph was meant as a guide for industry practitioners. Architects would know when they could expect an uptick in their work. Developers and financiers would know when to hit the brakes in the event of possible oversupply and builders would know when to begin work on new projects in order to take advantage of low materials prices. This graph and the entire way of thinking about construction which it embodied was made possible by the explosion of construction statistics over the early years of the 1920s. The Department of Commerce, under the leadership of Secretary Her uh, Herbert Hoover, viewed reliable statistical information as the key to a well-functioning market for housing. And here I'll zoom in on the graph itself. And I confess uh, this graph is at first glance not the easiest to interpret because there are essentially five axes here. On the horizontal axis, of course, is time with years represented in the first few cells and then months beginning in January 1921. And on the lower half of this uh, chart, there are two Y axes. Uh, the lines represent building activity with the left hand Y axis representing volume, and the right-hand side y-axis representing dollar value of new construction. And I should note, since it's not exactly obvious, that this graph was meant to indicate good news for the readers of the Architectural Forum. It was printed in the editor's monthly survey titled, 1923 should be a good year for architects, 
Printed in October of the year before, it pointed to a return to normal after the angst of the post-war housing shortage and recession of 1920 to 1921. Note the upward trend in the line titled Money Value of Contemplated Construction, beginning in October 20, 1921. The value of completed new construction ticks up at about a five to six month lag in February and March 20, 1922, and both lines continue their upward trend through most of the year. The novelty of this graph is hard to overstate. There is simply nothing like this prior to the 1920s, as is perhaps indicated by the fact that the lines of construction on the lower half of the graph do not extend further back in time beyond 1920. These data series simply did not exist prior to that year. But what I find especially remarkable about this graph is the fact that the authors do not simply describe the current trends of construction activity, but attempt to relate them to their ultimate causes, namely the cost of materials and the cost of, of capital. The upper half of the chart represents these costs. The y-axis on the upper half represents costs, and the lines shown are building costs, as well as a commodity index, which probably comes from another business publication, and the line uh, which the authors refer to as the curve of stabilization, around which is a shaded area the authors refer to as the zone of stabilization. And the authors are able to extend the lines on the upper half of this graph further back in time, because unlike for construction, there was reliable information on the prices of raw materials as far back as the early years of the century. As the authors of the graph indicate, the recent uptick in construction, which began in October 1921, corresponded to the time at which these inflated costs after the First World War came under control. The trend line of building costs fell into this zone of stabilization in October 1921 precisely the time at which construction started to pick up. As the authors note, with the decline of construction costs into the zone of stabilization, the first healthy signs of speculative building activity have developed, particularly in the various classes of buildings which constitute dwellings. There was hope, in other words, that the market was beginning to resolve the housing shortage which had plagued the nation since the end of the First World War. And, um, the text below the graph explains how the line of stabilization on this chart is computed uh, through A, an analysis of time involved in return to normal economic conditions after the Civil War and that of 1812, so two previous wars. B, the effect of economic control exercised by the Federal Reserve Bank in accelerating this return after the recent war. And this I find fairly remarkable because as early as 1922, less than 10 years after the formation of the Federal Reserve in 1913, economists are considering the effect of interest rate changes on prices for raw materials, and presumably also recognizing that the effect of the federal funds rate on the macro economy is mediated by its impact on housing. And then finally, C, an estimate of the probable normal increase in building costs, what we would today refer to as inflation. So to emphasize once, once again, it's truly remarkable how modern aspects of this graph are. Um, when the economist Paul Krugman speculates about the macro impacts of the Fed's rate hikes, as he did in an op-ed and on his Twitter page in the fall of last year, and just as the authors of the graph I just showed did, he looks to precisely the same series as the ones I just showed. His graph, Paul Krugman's graph, that is, on the right, is from the St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank using the construction put in place series of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is part of the Department of Commerce, and which itself comes ultimately from the FW Dodge Corporation. And really all of these series uh, emerged in their modern form in the early 1920s. In the context of the 1920s, the data presented on this graph were meant to perform a stabilizing role. And to quote from Herbert Hoover in his introductory speech to a 1923 uh, conference convened by his department, viewing the disastrous phenomenon of boom and slump in the light of what the government can properly do I believe there has been a great underestimation as to the potential importance of commer to commerce and industry of an adequate service of statistics. I believe that the stability and soundness of business can be greatly enhanced and that vicious speculation can be curtailed by a more adequate information service. We should have more timely, more regular, and more complete information of the current production and consumption and stocks of the great commodities in the United States. As we all know, this faith in data did not subdue the fluctuations of the market. In the early years of the 1930s, construction and new housing supply fell to their lowest levels since the First World War and stayed there for many years. The Roaring Twenties ended with a catastrophic real estate bubble, fueled by the proliferation of mortgage-backed securities, which left millions of Americans penniless, 
and seriously hindered the recovery of the nation's financial sector. The real estate field's most advanced development firms and financiers, those who had stood at the vanguard of the new techniques of real estate market analysis and construction forecasting, proved to be the era's most wicked villains. It is easy in hindsight to condemn the blind spots of the 1920s as symptoms of a passive and nepotistic regulatory state willing to ignore the predations of the decade's builders and mortgage lenders. It is just as easy to, to dismiss the excesses of the decade as yet another episode of irrational exuberance, an inevitable spasm of overleveraged development in a decade of minimal federal regulation. But both explanations, I think, miss the mark. In this period, construction, real estate, and housing production were monitored and analyzed, if not exactly regulated, to an unprecedented degree of precision. Over the course of the 1920s, the national real estate market came into focus as a coherent economic object capable of being forecasted and managed. The parameters of this market bore the imprint of active federal policy, which encouraged the dissemination of industry information, the adoption of industry standards and common practices, and the formation of large industry-wide organizations whose purpose was to coordinate production in line with the public in interest. As I argue, these federal policies and the industry changes which resulted rested on a coherent philosophy formulated at the very centers of American economic thought and policy discourse, namely the National Bureau of Economic Research, founded in 1920, and Herbert Hoover's Department of Commerce. This talk today is thus first a history of the nation's federal apparatus for collecting statistics on construction, housing markets, and mortgage capital flows, nearly all of which had been put into place in essentially their contemporary form between 1920 and 1930. But the origin story of these federal statistics also has lessons that transcend this one historical moment of a century ago. I also intend this chapter and this talk today as a cautionary tale about the dangers of a blind trust in statistical information and in the capacity of private actors to use that information for socially desirable ends. The notion that sound, rationally managed corporate actors would use the newly available statistical series to temper their behavior and to moderate the construction industry's speculative impulses was not just a tacit but an explicit purpose of this national monitoring system. This faith in numbers, as well as the corresponding faith that the real estate industry would use these numbers to regulate its own behavior, would not survive the decade. But the statistical apparatus which had grown in tandem with this faith is still with us and continues to serve as one of the preeminent windows onto the nation's housing supply and broader economic health. And furthermore, as I'll detail at the end of this talk, the data collected in this period and the economic ideas they helped to form were in many ways the direct foundation of the massive federal housing interventions of the 1930s in the form of the Federal Housing Administration and its now infamous original underwriting standards. Now, to help set the scene, imagine a hypothetical economic scenario, a severe housing shortage, a looming and potentially protracted recession despite home prices remaining out of reach for many would-be buyers, and all of this against the backdrop of pervasive price inflation. You would be forgiven for thinking I'm describing the present context, and indeed, the parallels with the present moment are one of the reasons I find this period so revelatory. This graph, included by the F.W. Dodge Corporation's Thomas Steele Holden in a 1923 article on the nation's ongoing housing crisis, is, like the one I previously showed, one of the first statistical analyses of a housing shortage to appear in print. The nation's housing shortage first surfaced with the return of military personnel at the end of 1918 and continued to be perceived as a crisis well into the 1920s. This graph here shows monthly totals of construction activity across the 27 northern and eastern states with the dashed line indicating the long run seasonal average and the solid line the actual trend. Note that construction contracts fell significantly below the seasonal norm from mid-1920 through late 1921, before sub subsequently rising significantly above the average for all of 1922 and 23. This chart shows, in graphical form, the gap in housing production which manifested as a nationwide housing shortage in the first years of the 1920s. And one additional bit of context about this graph, um, at the time this appears in the early 1920s, this is well before economists developed the idea that demand is something that can be quantitatively measured. So this comparison of the actual volume of, of production in the solid black line with the historical average trend in the dotted line 
is a sort of shorthand way of understanding the extent to which actual construction measures up to what society needs. From the perspective of the country's leading economists, the country's shortage of housing was a sort of paradox. A well-functioning free market shouldn't have shortages. Supply should rise to meet society's needs. Rents and home prices rose sharply after the war. Why didn't construction rise in tandem? And it's worth emphasizing here, the US was not the only country to experience a housing crisis in these years. The shortage also reached crisis levels in Britain and France after the World War. Those countries, of course, responded with the first large-scale experiments in public housing, and there were indeed calls for similar interventions in the United States. But for many American economists and business people and their allies in government, such a heavy hand for the state was unthinkable in the US. The perspective that developed instead in the US was, this is a market failure, so let's make the market function better. We have to modernize the construction industry so that it is better able to meet society's needs on its own. It is no coincidence, I think, that these first serious attempts to understand the economics of housing supply emerged in this context. The perspective that a better functioning free market could adequately resolve the nation's housing shortage was an antidote to widespread calls for government-built public housing in the European model. The paradox of America's housing shortage in the early 1920s was the central problem that confronted the new Commerce Secretary Hubert Her Herbert Hoover when he assumed office in March 1921. This paradox was compounded by the mass unemployment sparked by the Depression of 1920 to 1921, a crisis which had been building for nearly a year by the time Hoover took office. The simultaneity of these two vast problems was the formative challenge for Hoover as Commerce Secretary. How could the United States, with its boundless productive capacity, have both a surplus of workers and a shortage of housing? Why was the market not channeling the abundance of labor towards this scarcity of built space? The individual occurrence of either one of these problems risked pushing the populace towards Bolshevism. Their co-occurrence risked discrediting the laissez-faire approach to economic management itself, the idea that a competitive market system could on its own yield socially desirable outcomes. Herbert Hoover's work at the Department of Commerce over the course of the 1920s represented an effort to resolve this paradox, to bring a new era of stability to American economic life with minimal government intervention, precisely by removing barriers in the way of a well-functioning free market for housing. Data was integral to this vision. The response of Hoover and his Department of Commerce over the course of the 1920s points to the three legacies of the decade for contemporary housing scholarship. The first, and as I've already detailed, is as the origin point of the data sources we currently use to understand the housing market and construction sector. One of Hoover's first decisions as Secretary of Commerce was to install in the, in the Commerce Department a division of building and housing, whose purpose would be to compile and distribute information from the various elements of the building trades in order to facilitate greater efficiency in building production. Hoover's central objective as Commerce Secretary was to develop this division into an information service for the construction industry, a central repository for private statistics, as well as a research laboratory filling the, gap, filling the gaps left by private series. And Hoover was aided in this objective by the executives of the FW Dodge Corporation, which had for decades already been active in the market for construction statistics in local markets in the Eastern United States. One of Dodge's executives, the economist Franklin T. Miller, joined Hoover's Department of Commerce as an unofficial advisor in the first several months of Hoover's term and helped to assemble a network of statisticians capable of making sense of the statistics his company was amassing. And this close working relationship between Hoover and F.W. Dodge executives is the origin of really all of the graphs and statistics I've shown up to this point. Um, nearly all of this information about the volume of monthly construction across the country and state by state, which we can all access on the website of the U.S. Census, comes ultimately from F.W. Dodge, which continues to supply this information to the U.S. Census. This information was to be the workhorse of the transformed free market for housing, which Hoover and his allies in academia and the business world envisioned. The solution to the nation's housing shortage that emerged at the highest levels of government and academia was not a stronger hand for government per se, but rather a tamed business world working collectively to maintain the economic and social stability, which was clearly in its own interest. <laughs> 
The vision which took shape at Hoover's Department of Commerce over the following years was of a business community voluntarily adopting methods of planning, production standards, and interfirm cooperation in order to avert such market failures as a nationwide, nationwide housing shortage in the future. To return once again to this image, this graph and others like it represented a truly new way of thinking about the housing market. Housing, the most fundamental human need after food and water, could for the first time be understood as the product of an economic process. Indeed, could not be understood independently of other economic trends, such as the rate of interest and the cost of labor and materials. Statistical information of the type printed on this chart would enable private actors to time their production accordingly and thus reduce the extremes of the market cycle. Overproduction in boom times was self-evidently at odds with the interests of every individual producer. In this new vision, government's limited role would be to secure information about private sources, from private sources, to compile these various resources into a comprehensive snapshot of economic movements, and to generate market analysis using that information, which would then be freely distributed to members of the building industry. Hoover's division of building and housing was meant to function as a sort of weather service for the business world, not regulating private actors outright, but giving them the information they needed to make more sensible decisions. This function points to the second legacy of this period for contemporary housing debates, and this is truly a timeless one. What role, if any, should government play in the supply of housing? And here, an additional bit of context, uh, political context, is necessary. Calls for greater government involvement in the built environment had been building since the final years of the 19th century across a broad cross-section of American society. These calls obtained a new sense of urgency with the acute nationwide shortage of housing after the First World War. And there was, of course, already a long and established tradition of municipal, state, and even federal intervention in the built environment in the form of public works. The idea that government should invest in basic infrastructure such as roads and waterworks, as well as civic structures such as schools, post offices, courthouses, and municipal buildings was widely accepted, even by those who feared the prospect of government overreach. Government intervention in civic infrastructure was somehow less controversial than government action in most other spheres of economic life. But direct government intervention into the supply of housing was an altogether different matter. The nationwide housing shortage was already the subject of a major Senate investigation by the time Hoover took office. The US Senate's Calder Committee established in 1920 was the first such federal investigation into the nation's building stock and released its final report on the nation's housing situation just days before Hoover took office. Its findings would be formative for Hoover's vision of the appropriate role for government in the supply of housing. The committee's report portrayed the housing problem as one of dis di industrial disorganization. The stunted production of built space after the war reflected the country's fragmented, dysfunctional, and inefficient construction sector. This Senate investigation had begun with the intention of, of uncovering abuses on the part of both construction labor and mortgage capital, but it concluded by essentially blaming labor for the lack of good quality housing. In the Senate's estimation, construction unions drove up the cost of new housing by disrupting the construction process, orchestrating strikes, setting prices for materials, and refusing to work with certain material suppliers. A utopia of universal high quality buildings seemed to be attainable with modern production and management techniques, but it was blocked in this view by the perceived backwardness of construction labor. To prod the construction industry towards modernization became the central policy objective of Hoover's Department of Commerce. And in practical terms, the goal of modernizing the construction sector man manifested in two specific policy areas for the Department of Commerce. The first and one of the few interventionist pushes of Hoover's work in these years was to standardize local level building codes and regulations across American jurisdictions. The country's first wave of zoning ordinances was really a product of this work. In 1922, the Department of Commerce sponsored and published a zoning primer, which would become an important reference point for the 1929 Regional Plan of New York and its environs, as well as for countless local zoning ordinances over the course of the 1920s. The primer served as the basis for the Standard State Zoning Enabling Act issued by the Department of Commerce in 1924, thereby, thereby providing the basic legal framework for development controls and land use planning in the United States 
The Commerce Department's Division of Building and Housing closely tracked the progress of urban planning and zoning nationwide, from 1926 onwards publishing the annual zoning progress in the United States, which documented um, methods of urban planning and growth management and offered its own recommendations on best practices. Zoning really was a direct extension of the department's efforts to streamline the, the production of built space by private actors. And to quote from the Commerce Department's zoning primer, by zoning, millions in waste from the scrapping of buildings in blighted districts may be eliminated. A blighted district is a district originally developed for residents or industry in the future of which people have lost confidence. Dwellings worth in the aggregate of millions of dollars for the purposes for which they have been built and physically fit to serve those purposes for many years to come with a moderate investment in alterations and improvements are thus annually abandoned to purposes for which they are not fit or at left to stand practically idle. The total economic loss is enormous, and this loss and the risk of it are paid by the people in the price of house rents or otherwise, as inevitably as they pay the price of the enormous fire losses, either directly or through, through insurance. One other dimension of the department's work was to give both active and tacit support to the ongoing professionalization and consolidation of the business of real estate finance and development. The Department of Commerce and its associates in the business world viewed with favor the rapid extension in interregional mortgage lending at the hands of large mortgage bond houses over the course of the decade, companies which raised money for new construction projects by selling financial assets to the American people in the form of mortgage-backed securities. The department lent its active support to private industry bodies, such as the National Association of Real Estate Boards and the American Construction Council, which were then working to establish interjurisdictional standards of property appraisal, mortgage origination, and building regulations. And an implicit purpose of the information furnished by the Department of Commerce was to encourage the formation of larger and more sophisticated development firms, a closer liaison between the worlds of construction and finance, greater liquidity in the mortgage market, the taming of the country's countless different local markets by the rational management of trained economists, and thus a greater degree of stability in the urban development process. Larger, more sophisticated business units would be capable of working continuously through the year rather than seasonally, adhering to tested standards of design and building engineering, employing advanced techniques of mass production and distribution, and with greater access and legibility to the nation's capital markets. The larger business units of the new construction industry would base their development decisions on sound market data, indicating the present levels and trajectories of materials prices, labor costs, rents, and national construction volume. To mandate or fashion these changes directly was beyond the remit of the state, but government agencies nevertheless could nudge the industry towards these ends by compiling business information and disseminating best practices. Municipal building codes were themselves a means by which to nudge the market towards the provision of adequate housing for all. And the following years would seem to validate the actions of the Department of Commerce on these fronts. By the end of the 20s, the acute housing shortage of the early 20s had passed. Following the slack year of 1921, the period from 1922 to 1928 saw an immense housing boom of both multi-unit apartments and detached single family homes. The housing boom of the, of the decade is evident on this graph, printed in the Architectural Forum in January of 1928. The stunted production of 1921 is visible, with an ascending staircase of escalating construction in each of the years following. This prolonged wave of housing development seemed to confirm the capacity of a streamlined private sector to meet the nation's housing needs. The third legacy of the quantitative revolution in housing scholarship of the 1920s was finally a new body of applied scholarship about the housing market and its economic drivers. The true size and complexity of the construction sector and its largest component, housing supply, came into view with the new sources of statistical information then emerging. To view, to view construction as a cohesive industry encompassing not just the on-site building activity itself, but the respective processes of raw materials production, design, engineering, etc., seems itself to be a product of this era. In the words of F.W. Dodge's Thomas Steele Holden, the conception of construction as a well-defined industry is a new one and has not yet been generally accepted. We are accustomed to think of the lumber industry, the brick and clay industries, the cement industry, the contracting business, the architectural and structural engineering professions, and the building trades as units but we rarely consider them all grouped together as various elements of an enormously diverse and complicated industry whose finished product is that very important economic unit 
a building. With construction defined thus, no industry save agriculture employed a greater number of workers or yielded a greater amount of wealth. Likewise, no industry was nearly so complex or so ramified. A single construction project was the initiator of a practically endless series of transactions, stimulating production on, on the part of dozens of different industries. Stabilizing the construction cycle and thus putting to work the millions of laborers left idle in times of recession rested ultimately on stabilizing construction. By the latter years of the decade, the explosion of statistics the Department of Commerce encouraged gave industry participants, policymakers, and economists a degree of confidence that the excesses of the real estate field had been subdued. Monthly statistics on construction allowed members of the industry to detect incipient bubble dynamics and to avoid getting caught in the vortex of speculation. The Florida land boom of 1926, the original Ponzi scheme orchestrated in part by Char Charles Ponzi himself of Boston, was destructive to those involved, but nevertheless contained to that state. Industry observers had been able to track month by month the suspicious uptick in construction activity, land prices, and real estate transactions in the beachfront communities and unpopulated Everglades of Florida over the course of 1926. A national conflagration had been avoided. By the late 20s, the vast supply of information on the industry's performance seemed to have transformed this once backward field into a national organism that was greater than the sum of its parts, a cohesive engine of employment and wealth creation that could even serve as a stabilizing mechanism of the economy as a whole. Housing production had truly become the balance wheel of business, a lever for ensuring full employment and industrial stability and a mechanism which could be managed by policymakers and their allies in business to counterbalance the fluctuations of the economy at large. Few observers in the late 20s noticed the warning signs which by the early 30s would seem obvious. An immense construction boom in spite of a surfeit of quality space, an epidemic of office vacancies, a systemic tendency for developer, developers and their financial backers to overappraise the value of their proposed projects the use of the stock and bond markets to finance the entire cost of new buildings. The devastating anticlimax of this process was, was the nationwide collapse of property markets at the end of the decade. The subsequent breakdown of the national system of mortgage finance in the early 30s was perceived by this uh, network of thinkers at the Department of Commerce as a colossal market failure. In the short term, the Commerce Department's hopes for a self-regulating industry of housing construction were an abject and obvious failure. Data alone failed to balance the pro-cyclical behavior of developers and investors. The nationwide collapse of mortgage lending and real estate markets in the early 30s was cathartic. The extreme misconduct of the industry's largest firms shattered the Hooverite vision that large real estate corporations could regulate themselves and thereby satisfy the nation's housing needs using business information alone. By 1928, of course, Hoover had risen from his role as Commerce Secretary to become president, and the events of the early 30s would require a near complete reversal of his earlier positions. The onset of the Great Depression fueled a conflagration of rage at the injustices of the nation's fully private system of urban development, a system in which large real estate concerns took outrageous bets with other people's money, and the majority of American households were essentially priced out of homeownership while also facing limited options in the rental market. In September 1931, the now President Herbert Hoover convened thousands of the nation's leading housing scholars, urban economists, real estate business people, planning advocates, legal experts, civil rights leaders, architects, and engineers to analyze the current state of the nation's property markets and propose possible remedies to the evident disarray. The deep and prolonged collapse in construction, members of the building trades represented nearly 30% of the nation's unemployed by the mid-1930s lent a sense of urgency to research into the cyclical dynamics and crisis tendencies of urban growth. The data assembled by the Department of Commerce over the course of the 1920s provided the material through which this collapse was understood and pointed the way towards a new set of public interventions. The New Deal housing interventions of the subsequent Roosevelt administration, foremost of which was the Federal Housing Administration, or FHA, were themselves a direct descendant of the conferences on housing called by Herbert Hoover in 1931 and 1932. In many ways, the FHA would adopt the role envisioned for the modernized free market idealized in the laissez-faire years of the 1920s. The anger and desperation of the early 30s translated into the political will to subordinate the interests of capital to the housing needs of the nation, 
For a brief moment in the early 30s, these efforts signaled the promise that the housing needs of all Americans, including African Americans, might be satisfied by directing the technical genius of industry towards the planned redevelopment of America. As we all know, this is not exactly what happened. The painstakingly detailed redlining maps on which the FHA based its lending decisions, parceling the nation into zones of risk on the basis of their underlying racial composition, were a direct outgrowth of the mania for data collection in support of construction and mortgage lending decisions, which the Department of Commerce had fostered over the course of the 1920s. And while this lineage is more complicated than I'm able to, to detail in my concluding, concluding remarks here, Statisticians and economists connected to Hoover's Department of Commerce were integral in canvassing the nation uh, in order to construct these maps over the course of the 1930s. The final legacy of the quantitative revolution in housing scholarship in the 1920s is likewise mixed. The perception that housing provision could be made to function as an immense counterweight to the broader business cycle did indeed outlast the 1920s and was itself a formative principle for the, the federal housing programs of the 1930s, one which was explicitly discussed by economists at the FHA well into the 1950s. But this role for government in the supply of housing has largely been put on the back burner in the modern era. The FHA is not expected to perform the role of balancing the macroeconomy in the way that, say, the Federal Reserve is expected to. But the notion that housing is nevertheless at the center of American economic life persists to this day. Our ability to quantify this role, to calculate in numbers housing's contribution to national wealth is unthinkable without the quantitative revolution in housing scholarship of the 1920s. Thank you. Tommy, what do <laughs> what, what an, uh, just I'm just blown away. What what a wonderful tour de force. Um, and and you know, as I said at, at the onset, uh, at the outset, excuse me, that so much of this is just to me is is so resonant of of the um, of of the current of, of the current day. Um, so some some questions. Um, Thank you so much for that, Dave. Yeah, no, I, I just, I, you know, um, and, and also just, uh, I really appreciate the care that went into your presentation that the, you know, just the, the way you, you tell the story. Uh, I'm not surprised. Um, there was a question that, that came in um, about the role of tax policy. And, and we know that the treatment of real estate in, in tax policy is um, something that, is is a is a feature kind of a, of the contemporary era, but uh, I'm wondering when. I don't know if your research touched on this, but when when did tax policy become part of the sort of toolkit of how the government tried to incentivize or disincentivize real estate investment? Um, so, as you'll see in the Q and A, we know that that's a a feature of the '70s and '80s, but I don't know if it predates that. Um, so I'm. I should state, first of all, that um, I've focused on one very specific uh, body of thought uh, over the course of the 1920s, one that's centered at the Department of Commerce and, to a lesser extent, the National Bureau of Economic Research. Um, these economists and statisticians who are really focused on um, quantifying how much supply there is. Um, and trying to think in terms of things like economic cycles. There are, however, parallel um, kind of nexuses of thinkers, uh, some of them a bit more connected to industry that are doing separate work uh, that would later intersect with this work. And one of those one of those nexuses of thinkers is centered, centered at the University of Chicago. So economists who are developing the sort of first economics of how property markets work. And these are economists who would then sort of en masse migrate to Washington in the early 30s to help devise the FHA's first underwriting manual. Um, but then an additional separate nexus of thinkers is these um, thinkers who are really focused, uh, centered around, say, the National Association of Real Estate Boards, so like these industry organizations who are um, trying over the course of the 1920s to uh, basically get 
deductions for uh, obsolescence, like uh, sort of depreciation allowances. And I mean, really the, the sort of canonical recent, recent book about this is Dan Abramson's Obsolescence, which really focuses on, to a much greater degree, I mean, I haven't focused on that at all in this talk, um, but focuses to a great degree on tax policy in the US uh, in the teens and 20s and the way in which that was an outgrowth of debates that members of the building industry were having. There's a, a question, um, a, a sort of comparative question about how our housing statistics system compares with those of, of other industrialized countries. Uh, I, I know all of us at the Joint Center have always had this experience of having, I was just talking with an architect from Brazil, is like, I wish I had the U.S. system in Brazil, because we have no idea what's going on. But I'm, I'm wondering, do other countries have similar systems, or is ours really unique because of this interesting public-private history, perhaps? I mean, this is a great question. So I know a little bit more about a comparison of these, uh, sort of the statistics about like contemporary market snapshot across different countries. And um, I mean, some countries, for instance, like essentially have a publicly accessible uh, MLS. So all real estate, real estate transactions across the country going back to some period of time, probably still in the, in the digital era. So sometime in the 90s can be accessed by anyone. Um, and this of course is really useful for, uh, for scholars, but I actually know less about um, this type of historical data series. Um, I mean, the, the US census's data, which much of which, as I mentioned, comes from the FW Dodge Corporation. So, I really don't know if there are equivalents of companies like the FW Dodge Corporation in other countries. Um, yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that, and I'm I'm really curious. I, I I was really struck in in your talk by this question of the data that is collected publicly and in theory is publicly accessible accessible to the public, and the data collected. Uh, and disseminated by private entities. Um, and, and it looks like, you know, on the one hand in the 20s, it's primarily a public exercise, although the graphs you showed are from private. And, and I was thinking about it in the context of the modern day when a lot of the, the, the sort of major digital tools that investors and operators use are phenomenally expensive and therefore yeah not particularly accessible to the public. And I, I don't know if you've thought about this both over time, the shift between what's public and what's private and, and kind of where we are in that, in that spectrum today. So um, one, I guess, before I uh, run with that question, one detail about the graphs that I've shown is that um, they are typically printed, uh, the ones that I showed from the 20s are typically printed in business publications, but they are using data series that are disseminated by the Department of Commerce and the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, and so it was the Department of Commerce that was really centralizing the data itself and uh, making it publicly available. And then private business uh, publications really ran with that data and produced insights off of them. And this was very much in line with the philosophy of Herbert Hoover, that basically the role of government, like it's a sandbox, like we make all of this data available. It's up to the private sector to discover how that's useful and relevant to them. Um, on the question of public and private data, I mean, one thing that's I was gonna say different or sort of unique about the present day, but it's, there's very much the same uh, question in the twenties is, I mean, there's, there's so much fairly recent and very granular high quality data available today about the built environment in particular um, that is being produced by private entities. I mean, Zillow is the first that comes to mind, but there are several other big data providers like Zillow that collect aspects about different aspects of real estate, 
buildings, housing market. Um, and I mean, these data can provide really time specific, you know, temporally and spatially granular data that um, isn't really being, there's not the same compulsion as there was in the 1920s to uh, make public data that private entities are producing. And uh, I didn't mention this in the talk, but there, there was a legal case in the 1920s about like, is the Department of Commerce legally allowed to compel private entities to share their data? Uh, this was an important legal case that kind of made possible a lot of the uh, data centralization that both the Department of Commerce and the National Bureau of Economic Research did. And the conclusion of this case was uh, requiring that companies share data is not regulating them. Uh, it's the government is perfectly within its sort of legal rights to compel the sharing of information. And this is something that makes it possible to put these sort of very diverse uh, sources of information in dialogue with one another. Um, and, and there's really an interest in, you know, in a time that's otherwise very conservative in the way it conceives of government's role. Um, there's really an interest in getting government to sort of uh, be an information service for civil society in general. I was gonna say like the free market, but it's civil society in general. Um, and there doesn't seem to be that same push today. Um, the government agencies perform a very important role in doing their own surveys and collecting their own original data. Um, and nevertheless, there is this huge stock of statistics that the private sector is producing. And I mean, many academics put these data sources in dialogue with one another, but um, it can be quite expensive to access these private sources of information, which I think is really a limitation that probably many academics, many academics doing quantitative social science research have encountered. And I do think that's a shame. Yeah, and uh, just to build on that, if you think about, and this tries to draw a thread out of a couple of questions that, that have come up, um, given the digital revolution, digitalization, um kind of the the landscape of, of the present what do you do you have some thoughts on what would be particularly um valuable ways um that the government that the public sector might be putting out uh data that would that would be more useful for social purpose um for example spurring the supply of housing that's affordable uh um I mean, one of the things that I, uh, I'm hesitant to give too much agency to data itself. I, and I think that's one of the takeaways I got from doing this research about the 20s, like the ideology. I mean, there was really an ideology of data in the 1920s that took hold of so many institutions. Um, I mean, the Department of Commerce, the National Bureau of Economic Research, the American Statistical Association, like these sort of biggest research centers in the United States, uh, many of which had either been formed in the 20s or recently formed, they all were sort of captivated by this idea that um, data was going to fix everything, that just if you could uh, collect more timely information and um, at a sort of finer spatial resolution and make it available to everyone in the industry that this would iron out the kinks, that this would sort of tame the chaos of American capitalism. Um, and I mean, I'm not exaggerating. Like this is, this is a very coherent philosophy that is developed by really intelligent people over the course of the 1920s. And they completely miss the sort of crisis that's looming that culminates in the Great Depression. Um, like this is why, I mean, from the present perspective, occasionally there's articles about uh, the real estate market in the 1920s that frame it as this wild west where, um, I mean, the term irrational is always used to describe this period. And this is not exactly 
an accurate description of this market. Uh, there's actually some of the best information there's ever been. I mean, as good as anything we have today to help people understand what the state of the market is. And it doesn't fix the sort of crisis tendencies of American capitalism in this period. And so I'm skeptical of, um, I mean, more data and more data sharing are not on their own going to fix some of the deeper social and, and political issues that we face that are in the way of um, addressing the housing crisis today. I, I, on the other hand, I guess I, I would argue, you know, the Joint Center is an entity that one of the things that's so striking about your work is is the extent to which we, as you know, our bread and butter work is using this hundred yeah. year old data. Um, and yes, we we haven't fixed things, but it does it does allow you, I think, in certain circumstances, to marshal the data to document, help people understand the seriousness of problems. I mean, if you, when, when we, absolutely you know, when, when yes. we tell people the, the data, the kind of data you're describing tells us that, you know, 25% of renters are severely cost burdened. Um, it means, it means something. Um, we, we could, and you and I have had this conversation for a long time, but we did promise people we'd, we'd end uh, about now uh, at some point in your, in your presentation, um, I, I all of a sudden flashed on the, you know, the great uh, famous George Santayana quote, you know, those uh, those who cannot remember the past are, are condemned to repeat it. And I was just thinking in your answer about don't, you know, the data is useful, but it's not going to fix all of the problems. That's that, that that's something else, you know, I think resonates with that. I, I think you've done an enormous service by helping us both understand where we came from and to see both the the power and the limits of 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 efforts to basically make sure we have some idea what what's going on this is is wonderful work uh, as several people said in in their comments um, we all look forward to the book in the shorter term um i forgot to mention earlier that uh the Tommy's present a version of Tommy's presentation uh, will be published by the Joint Center relatively soon uh, as a working paper, um, and I think it's going to be a wonderful, wonderfully valuable sort of document for those of us in the field. I want to I want to thank you for just a wonderful presentation and um, that's sort of the tip of the iceberg of, of a much larger and and just truly wonderful piece of work. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for attending and have a great day. Thank you so much, Dave, and thanks again, everyone, for being here.